granddad. <clears throat> what are you doing? I want to see if this whole thing still works. Something I want to show you. This is an old film from the beginning of the transition. What year was this? Oh, way back. Early days. If you're an addict, and we're all addicted to fossil fuels pretty much in the world. First way to solve the problem is to admit you have a problem. 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. You know, we've been accustomed to having all of these luxuries and now we don't want any of the negative benefits. And it's the first time we're talking about our transition away from fossil fuels this seriously. So a decade ago, 195 countries got together at a summit in Paris. All the world leaders. Paris, it was uh, 2015. So this must be about 2025. Are you sure you want to do this right now? It's part of our history. This one? Yeah. All the world leaders turned up and they all agreed that we should get on track for this huge energy transition. After the agreement was signed, they went down to the nightclubs in Paris. All the delegates were there dancing into the middle of the night. It was a wonderful feeling of celebration. But it hasn't been as good as we hoped. The emissions rose to a new peak in 2024. Last year was the warmest year on record. The year before that was the warmest year before that. We know that it is the burning of fossil fuels that's the issue. That's been demonstrated by every scientific institution that we have, and there's no argument to convince us otherwise at this point. So we have a choice as a society. Do we want to invest now to decrease the impacts of climate change, or do we want to enable future generations to be paying at a much higher rate? We need to get over to using more renewables, solar energy, wind energy, the scale of this transition is huge because it affects everybody in the whole world. The world needs to cut emissions by 7.5% a year. That's never happened in human history. We are trying to move away terawatt hours of uh, demand, supply, generation, distribution, storage, all of these things from an existing model of infrastructure and finance do something that's clean and sustainable. And I think that's probably the hardest thing humanity has done uh, so far. There is enough technology, engineering, money, even government policy, international policy. If there was the will to mobilize that, th this energy transition could be quite a short journey. We have to maintain that hope that while it's not going as quickly as we want or as smoothly as we want, that it can still happen and we can leave a better world for future generations. But it requires people to believe that they're participating in a greater good. We do have the tools. What we are missing is three things. Implementation, implementation, implementation. When you scale a new technology, you can say, ah, does it really work? We know now it works. What we have to do now is to industrialize it and scale it like never before. You need to have trust in the way forward. And also the government needs to have the policy consistently. So if you want to go to that road, you should not change it. After four years, after new government, I think it's very important to understand how the current fossil fuel industries are going to cope with this transition. Because if we don't bring them on board, they become a barrier. And that means reducing the speed of transition, and we can't afford to do that. We need to transition away from oil and gas as fast as possible, but we need to do that in a safe and sustainable way as well. That can only happen with those oil and gas companies playing a leading role also in the energy transition. The embedded knowledge in that industry is incredible. Oil and gas engineers could help to engineer offshore wind farms. Sometimes we're fixated on the idea that there's still plenty of fossil fuels available. Why would we stop using them? They didn't run out of stones for the Stone Age to come to an end. 
This is the only future that we can really be working towards. It's possible that in three decades from now, people looking back at uh, the energy transition will be even surprised that it was such a hot topic because they would consider it natural that most of our energy comes from electricity and most of that electricity is produced by wind and solar. Hard to imagine, but you would have never seen a window here. All of this would have been dry, dead land. The systems thinking is so critical because we need to be able to have people that can understand the big picture because we can't change just one piece of it without thinking through the other pieces. Ideally, we could just deploy electricity grids everywhere, electrify everything because with electrification comes decarbonization and we could switch off, you know, all fossil fuel systems in one go. But that doesn't guarantee energy security. There's a lot of real human needs that get covered by fossil fuels, and that's why we're talking about transition fuels like natural gas. And that is where we talk about whole uh, energy systems thinking, that the energy transition is largely about electrification, but then there's also an important piece about decarbonizing the whole energy sector, whether it's using carbon capture and storage, or moving to cleaner fuels such as hydrogen. One important aspect of research right now is how you can adapt existing pipelines that were built to uh, take natural gas to be pipelines for hydrogen or for a hydrogen natural gas lend. In five, four, three, two, one, fire. If we are still going to have to use oil or gas, then we need to take responsibility for minimizing the greenhouse gas emissions that come off that. If all that wasn't difficult enough, they had to deal with a power grid that in many places was old and was never designed for what we needed it to do. The power grid is the biggest machine that we have ever built. And this machine that we built over the past 100 years, it needs to double within the next 20 years. And it's taking us 15 to 18 years to build any one new transmission line or, or distribution line. This is a huge challenge of how do we decarbonize our electricity grid. Our energy system is not very well connected and it's actually rather inefficient because we have been working, I would say, in silos. We have some wind turbines, we have some gas plants, we have... And so far, and so on. What we can do through digitalization and the connectivity with the grid is that we can actually now start to connect it and optimize like never before. We need to embrace digital technology in the way that we both gather data, uh, analyze that data, and also make better, faster decisions. So we are trying to shift our energy system from traditional fossil fuels, which are available in uh, some sort of containers anyway, uh, to an energy system that's powered by the sun and the wind, which is volatile during the day. And that's where storage comes in. We want to save energy during the times that we have an excess of it so that we can use it later when there is not enough and there is still demand in the system. Energy from the sun, energy from, from wind. The actual costs of that, um, the longer term operational costs are, are much smaller. Um, but it does mean that initial investment for the technologies, for the supporting infrastructure. But that pales into insignificance in terms of the longer term costs we're going to be faced with if we continue to use fossil fuels. Our generation will have to learn sometimes to give up our individual interest for the collective interest. Meaning you have to suffer your little idea for the big idea, for the big goal. It's easy for people to demand change, but when it threatens their way of living, it becomes a lot harder. Not in my backyard. You think folks were happy about these big wind parks out here? They had to be built somewhere, right? Exactly. Every one of us needed to change something if we wanted the things we love to stay the same.
if we in the world really want the non-fossil to grow much, much faster, we also have to make it much more financially attractive because people are driven by money. The energy transition creates a lot of great jobs, and we can create great jobs in manufacturing components for solar panels, for batteries, for wind turbines, for constructing the projects. Great jobs that are well paid, that are distributed, that people continue to live in their communities. It's funny to have to remind people that borders are arbitrary lines that we drew on a map, and we're just all living on the same planet. It's one climate, one ecosystem. Three quarters of our natural environment has been lost in 50 years. That can't continue. That takes us back to the question of whole system thinking, because the biodiversity is part of the system. We can't ignore the needs of nature when it comes to installing new power plants. We need to take that into account. If, if a government promises to cut emissions by 15% and then they only cut them by 5%, you feel let down and you feel, why should I be changing my lifestyle if the government or the company isn't doing this? It's hard. It's not always a straight path to where we want to be going. And sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. It's very frustrating to, to see, especially big powers around the world, backtracked on what science seems to portray very clearly. Climate change will continue. The real question is, will it be so bad that it will turn into a catastrophe? It's difficult nowadays to know what's true and what is not. You can find anything you want about the world on social media if you look for more than a few minutes. So we need to find ways in which the media and the governments can bolster trust in, in science. That's where companies like DNV come in to make sure that we pave the way towards our common truth. We need to set standards that everybody can follow so we can judge government performance or company performance against a set of international rules in a way. But fundamentally, we all must say we want this change because otherwise it will not happen. I would say electrification would have been coming anyway. The challenge is that because of the urgency, um, we need people to buy into these ideas maybe rather more quickly than would have been the case if we had just allowed, um, say, market forces to be the thing that drove the technology forward. So how do you convince people in developing economies to go directly to wind and solar? Renewables are cheaper, right? Even back then? Over time, yes. we we'll try to explain that to someone who's fighting to keep food on their family's table. Europe and North America need to transition faster to a net negative carbon economy to enable other countries their fair share of emissions, to enable them to participate in the transformation and invest in future technologies. China in 2023 commissioned solar power equivalent to what the whole world had commissioned the previous year. They are shifting towards solar power at an incredible rate. We're on the point of no return at the moment. I just hope enough people recognize that to take action sufficiently quickly 
to pull us back from that cliff edge. We have to solve this problem. There's no two ways about it. We need just to find the tipping point that will enable enough people to get on board so that this becomes an issue, an issue in local societies, an issue in families are discussing it around the table, an issue in governments. We should go out and tell the politicians, we'll give you the psychological support to get it done, because you will have to go through a very tough transition as a leader in making the biggest change maybe we have seen ever. There's some kind of idea sometimes that we're doing this for something else or for somebody else. But it's humankind and human civilization that's going to suffer and wither and the planet will carry on. That's what's going to happen if we don't nail this energy transition. I hope that future generations will see more to the meaning of life. It's not just about finances and possessions and, and individual appearances. It's about the living experience. The long-term vision is now already embedded in the population, in the humanity. So it, even some government officials change the policy, but it cannot change 100%. A lot of project is already under construction. You cannot stop it. The movement is very powerful now. The energy transition and all the people who are building, constructing, doing whatever they're doing, they are the real heroes. And those are the ones that we should remember and thank. I think the heroes of the story will be the ones that actually took sacrifice to make a change in their local communities, in their cities, in their countries, wherever it might be. I'm optimistic because I see that there are so many people working towards the energy transition that we will continue to push to make these changes as fast as is possible. I hope that if you're watching this film in 2055 that you're going to look forward to a life powered by renewable energies a planet that is cleaner, where biodiversity is protected, where, you know, we're living at peace with the Earth. <laughs>